Hello everyone and welcome to our webinar. The topic for today's webinar is Building Community Resilience with Green Mountain Power. This webinar is being presented by the Energy Storage Technology Advancement Partnership and that is a collaboration between the U.S. Department of Energy Office of Electricity, Sandia National Laboratories, and the Clean Energy States Alliance. Before I pass it over to our excellent panel, on today's webinar, I'd like to go over a few very quick webinar logistics. All of our attendees are in listen-only mode. You have a couple of options to join the audio portion of our webinar. You can connect via telephone, or you can call in via computer mic and speakers. If you'd like to minimize your webinar console so that you can view the presentation full screen, you can click on the orange arrow that you see circled here, and you can also click on that arrow to expand your webinar console. One of the things that you might like to do with your webinar console is to submit your questions and your comments. We'll be having a Q&A following our presentations, and we'll get to as many questions as we can, so do type those questions in. A final note, this webinar is being recorded. We'll send you an email uh, within about 48 hours with a copy of the webinar slides and the webinar recording. And we'll also post all of those materials on the CISA website at cisa.org slash webinars. So with that, I'll now pass it over to our moderator for today's webinar, my colleague, Todd Olinsky-Paul. Todd is a senior project director here at the Clean Energy States Alliance. Thank you, Samantha, and welcome to the webinar, everyone. Um, I will do a brief introduction of CESA and the SDAP program and then introduce our speakers for today. If you are joining us for the first time, uh, Clean Energy States Alliance is a nonprofit uh, located in Vermont. We work with state energy agencies across the country, helping them with clean energy programs and policy. And you can see on this slide the uh, logos of our many state members. Um, next slide, please. I want to explain a little bit about the STEP program, which is conducted under contract with Sandia National Laboratories and funded by DOE Office of Electricity. And we have uh, representatives of DOE and Sandia on this webinar today, so thank you very much to them for their support. Uh, STAP is the Energy Storage Technology Advancement Partnership, and um, basically it's a way for uh, DOE, Office of Electricity, and the National Lab, and CISA to coordinate energy storage deploy deployment projects in collaboration with mostly state and sometimes municipal entities across the country. And you can see uh, the map here, which actually is a little old and I need to update it, but we have many projects around the country under the STEP program. In addition to uh, deploying energy storage through this program, we also do lots of these webinars. We also produce case studies and reports. Uh, we present at conferences and so forth. So we, we do have a large information sharing uh, uh, activity. And we are increasingly also supporting state energy storage efforts with uh, policy and program development assistance. So uh, all of these things are um, explained in more detail on our website, and I encourage you to go take a look at that. Next slide, please. Uh, again, I want to thank Dr. Rizuk and Dan Borneo. They're both joining us today, and uh, they make this program possible. Next slide, please. Uh, Dan will be joining us for the Q&A only. Dr. Zhuk will be doing the making introductory remarks, so I'm going to, in a minute, pass the baton over to him, or the microphone. Uh, following Dr. Zhuk's remarks, we will be hearing from Sarah Ludwin Peary of Green Mountain Power. Uh, Green Mountain Power's program is what we are focusing on today. This is a Resilience Zones program, which is first in the nation, as far as I know, and a really interesting and exciting new way to uh, multi-purpose, large utility scale and utility owned energy storage projects for the support of the surrounding community. And of course, Sarah will get into what that means in a few minutes. And as I said, Dan Borneo from Sandia is joining us for the Q&A. Uh, while I'm thinking of it, we have 
A good number of participants uh, in the audience here today. We have so far uh, over 130 people logged in and more are coming. So if a question occurs to you during the course of the presentation, please type it into the question box uh, on the console on your screen and I will um, be looking at those as we go along and we'll answer as many as we can get to. Um, before I turn this over to Dr. Jok, I just want to say that uh, this is kind of a special webinar for us at CISA. Uh, I've been with CISA for 10 years, and when I started, I inherited the STAP contract, which was at that time, I think, fairly new. Uh, there weren't any projects develop, uh, deployed at that point under STAP. And shortly after um, joining CISA, we embarked with Sandia and DOE and Vermont uh, Department of Public Service on a joint effort to support a demonstration project here in Vermont. That was the Stafford Hill project, uh, which was developed around, uh, we started working on it, uh, the, the funding aspects of it in 2013, I believe, and it was developed over the next year. Um, and, and Dr. Juk will talk more about that. But uh, following on Stafford Hill, we've done a couple of other projects with Green Mountain Power. We've done the McKnight Lane project, uh, which is 14 uh, affordable housing units with solar and storage, here, also here in Vermont. And right now we're working on uh, a project in the Shi'ai region. For those of you who aren't located here in Vermont, Shi'ai stands for Sheffield Highgate Export Interface. It's a uh, region in the northern area of the state, and it's um, known to have congestion issues. It's a transmission export point, and uh, so the energy storage project under development there will help with that that problem. So uh, seeing GMP um, pushing energy storage into new applications across the state is, is very gratifying, and I'm very pleased to be able to do another webinar with them and to be continuing to be able to work with them. So that was it for my comments. Thank you for your indulgence. Um, I will now pass the mic over to Dr. Juk. Well, hello, I'm Imre Juk, and I direct the Energy Storage Research Program at the Department of Energy Office of Electricity. And today we are going to talk about a really important and exciting project here in Vermont, which GMP, uh, Green Mountain Power, is uh, putting together. Uh, Green Mountain Power is one of the really outstanding utilities uh, in the country. And uh, well, Vermont is one of the outstanding states. So. Uh, what I will do is I will give you a little bit of background to that uh, project and how it came about and why there is so much nice storage in Vermont. Well, one fine day we were sitting around the table and uh, saying, well, where shall we do the next project? And since Todd was just new with the uh, Clean Energy State Alliance, and uh, I said, well, why don't we do it in Vermont? You know, we have all the connections there, and let indeed, we agreed to uh, do it. And uh, within a week or so, uh, we put together a, a small workshop uh, between the Vermont Public Service, DOE, and CISA, and we invited all of the utilities in Vermont and then just discussed the possibility of having a uh, storage project. And uh, Green Mountain Power took up the, uh, the baton, and uh, presumably because they had been thinking about it for a long time, and uh, they put together uh, an answer to our solicitation. And this was a project uh, for essentially uh, backup 
for uh, a community center, which, which is an existing high school, uh, coupled with an already, uh, well, with a uh, solar project, which they already had in mind doing. So what we ended up with, we ended up with a four megawatt, 3.4 megawatt hour uh, of storage uh, project uh, integrated with two megawatts of PV. And at first it was just going to be backup, uh, but then after putting it through our various models at Sandia, uh, we decided, well, you know, this could be a project that pays for itself. And as you will see, uh, it did indeed. So the groundbreaking was on uh, in 2014. Uh, you can see a picture up there from the groundbreaking. Uh, this is Mary Powell, who was then CEO uh, and uh, the governor of the of the state, and well, myself and Todd Olinsky. And just about a year later, uh, it was built and commissioned. And in the picture, you can see the uh, storage facility. Well, actually, you can't see it because it's way back there. Uh, it's a very small set of yellow, uh, sorry, of uh, white boxes. And you see this humongous uh, field of photovoltaics. Uh, the way we configure this, the system can be isolated to provide emergency power for a resilient microgrid serving the high school as an emergency center. And the background for that was the ice storm, uh, Irene, which had uh, isolated the entire area for two weeks uh, a few years uh, back. So people in Vermont knew uh, why they wanted an emergency center. Uh, but it can also, in general, provide ancillary grid services and, as it turned out very importantly, demand charge reduction. And by the way, it was done uh, on a brownfield area. So how do you make the microgrid pay for itself? Well, everybody knows that you cannot uh, make it pay for itself by using arbitrage. So uh, we, and that means Green Mountain Power and DOE and CISA, hit upon using uh, demand charges. And these demand charges come in two flavors. Uh, one is the regional network ser service, and those are measured by monthly peak load. And the other one is the forward capacity market uh, payments, which are for regional capacity reserves to cover load excursions. And those are measured by yearly peaks, uh, one, uh, the day and one hour identified by the ISO uh, New England. Now, the project could also get financial benefits from frequency regulation, arbitrage, and what have you. But those two uh, monthly and uh, yearly peaks, demand charges, really were the main thing. And it turned out that we could make the project pay for itself in about uh, six years. And as you can see, a yearly peak here, uh, say, captured. Uh, $200,000 from the PV and the storage. Basically, you just let the dump the storage at the put monthly or yearly peak hours. Now, there were a number of follow-on activities that came from this. Uh, first of all, the uh, GMP Rutland project uh, was referenced as a model in the Vermont Energy Storage Plan. Uh, it was particularly uh, put down as an ideal way to run a project. It also triggered legislative hearings on potential storage mandate. Uh, I remember that because I uh, did a presentation there as well, and we had to wade through a foot deep uh, snowfall uh, in order to get to the Capitol. 
And then the Vermont Department of Public Service commissioned an energy storage study. There was also a project at McKnight Lane, uh, which had 14 units of PV and storage uh, for affordable housing. Now, these projects together, the Rutland project and the McKnight project, formed the background for the Patton uh, project, uh, which used uh, one megawatt of storage uh, linked with solar resiliency. And also the residential battery aggregation pro program, uh, which put up to 3,000 batteries uh, installed behind custom meters. So lots of things are linked to the success of this original project. Now, we also exported this abroad to nearby Sterling, Massachusetts, where we had a situation fairly similar. Uh, they had received the $1.5 million grant from uh, Massachusetts, and uh, we got together with them, and we, using the Vermont model, we showed that they could also uh, make this storage pay for itself and get the uh, backup for the uh, uh, police station, the police headquarters, uh, sort of as an extra benefit. It's done in lithium ion, again, provided by NEC, unfortunately now no longer uh, selling lithium ion. And it was a resiliency project with two megawatt and two, uh, two megawatt two hour storage, together with an existing 3.4 megawatts of PV. Now, once we had settled all that, uh, it went quite fast. We did the groundbreaking in December 2016. Must be the other way around. We did the groundbreaking in October 2016, and the commissioning was in December uh, of the same year. I'll rectify that in the slides eventually. And you can see me here among the groundbreaking crew, and this is the finished uh, station. This started getting income from the first year of operation. Uh, arbitrage, but mainly monthly peak and annual peak for a total of 400k per year. And you can see how this air, uh, got together slowly during the year with the monthly peaks, then there was a yearly peak, then uh, the, we had the monthly peaks aggregating up there, the yearly peak and the monthly peaks again. And the result of this that by April 2019, we had uh, saved the town uh, $1 million in avoided cost. Uh, we, they also had visitors from, well, all over, the, all over the place in the world. Uh, we also have another problem that uh, Todd already alluded to. It's the uh, Shi'ai project in North Troy, Vermont and it has to do with wind curtailment. They have a lot of wind in that area, uh, but they can't always get it on the north-south transmission, which forms a bottleneck. So the you know wind should go from the north to the population centers in the south, but they can't always do it, and therefore it has to be curtailed. Well, we are putting in three megawatts and 12 megawatt hours of storage, uh, about 5,500K uh, uh, is the cost of it. And we should mention that 100% of all the benefits uh, will accrue to Vermont retail customers. Now, all along, my real aim in doing these projects is to create the emergence of storage ecologies. Areas that are familiar with storage, know about storage, and apply storage. And chief among those is California, uh, 
where they eventually put up a mandate and they have the CEC and the good PUC to work for them. Uh, New York with its best uh, organization, uh, the Northwest, uh, Washington, Oregon, and Alaska, where we have uh, a fair number of projects and where they understand storage well. Uh, the Southwest is an emerging uh, uh, storage area, New Mexico and Arizona, and the Northeast with very advanced Vermont and Massachusetts. Ultimately, we can imagine the formation of, a local, of local resilience centers meshing into nested microgrids of increasing sizes. So that each area is fairly resistant on its own and incorporated in increasingly larger nested structures that will stay uh, able to function uh, even during emergencies. Now, a look at the future. We will need storage of various durations, short, medium, and long. Short duration, 15 minutes to one hour, will mainly be lithium ion, and it'll be for smoothing renewables and taking care of other small disturbances. But if we are going to have high penetration of renewables, we will need to be able to shift, uh, to carry daylight power into the night. And for that, we need four to 12 hours of storage, and lithium ion is not that suitable for that. Instead, I can see that the next wave of batteries will be flow batteries. And there are many of them pushing into uh, being commercialized. Finally, eventually, uh, if we want to have uh, full uh, decarbonization, we will need 12 hour to three, uh, three days uh, long duration storage. And for that, we will use not only flow batteries, uh, but thermal batteries, gravity batteries, and uh, chemical batteries. And we'll need a lot of storage, 12,000, 1200 to 2300 gigawatt hours of energy storage. Long duration storage is essential for the development of a decarbonized reliable grid. We can't do it without storage, but it will require new technology, new business cases, and new regulatory frameworks. And here in Vermont, we are well on the way to get there. Thank you. And thank you, Emery. Uh, so I would like to invite Sarah to do her presentation now, and then we will take questions. Please continue to type those questions in as they occur to you. Sarah, you're up. So hi, everyone. Um, first of all, thank you, CISA, for the invitation to speak at this webinar, and thank you to everyone for taking time out of your busy day to be here with me. So I'd like to start by talking a little bit about Green Mountain Power's proactive climate plan, which includes a number of targeted initiatives that aim to make our grid more resilient. Examples of these projects include undergrounding, installing insulated wire, replacing poles, and adding both utility scale and residential batteries. This all occurs in addition to our regular grid work. So while we continue to do the kind of maintenance pools and wires work that we've always done, we're also always trying to expand our efforts to include additional upgrades and the use of new technologies or methods to reduce outages and add new resiliency projects. Our aim is also to adhere to a faster timeline with the understanding that mitigating climate change requires us to act today. As we all know, time is of the essence and GMP has embraced a model of pilot projects which allow us to test out innovative solutions and provide important learning experiences for us to improve our ability to serve the needs of our customers. One key part of our climate plan is our resiliency zone projects. Resiliency zones are designed to be community hubs that stay connected when the lights go out. So these hubs can leverage technologies like batteries, local power generation like solar, and communications technologies. Each resiliency zone is unique. It's planned in partnership with the community that will house it. This is important because no two communities have the exact same resources or needs. 
So it's key to take into consideration the unique situation that each of our partner organizations is in. For example, while some communities have a downtown area that is well suited to a microgrid, in other communities, the areas with the greatest reliability challenges are remote and we better serve by residential battery storage solutions. As previously mentioned, GMP has been involved in microgrid projects since 2014. The Stafford Hill Solar Farm in Rutland, Vermont, was part of an effort to improve the resiliency of Vermont communities that were hit hard by Hurricane Irene back in 2011. A central component of the microgrid's design is to supply backup power to a public emergency shelter at the Rutland City High School. More recently, GMP developed a similar microgrid in Panton. For this Panton project, we partnered with the community, the town of Panton, to leverage a local solar project which already existed and was already providing clean power close to where it was being consumed and add batteries to allow for peak shaving savings and to enable microgrid capabilities. This microgrid is operational as of October 2021 and the goal is to keep the power on during outages for about 50 customers in Panton to start with a planned possible expansion of the coverage area to include another 900 customers on the circuit. Going forward, we will use the lessons learned from these projects to develop a number of additional resiliency zones across our service territory. So the first part of the process to select communities to partner with us was to develop a data-driven municipal vulnerability index. This index uses data related to reliability, social vulnerability, and communications infrastructure. We incorporated six different categories of data, two for each component. For reliability, we looked at both outage duration and outage frequency. For social vulnerability, we looked at a CDC social vulnerability index, as well as energy burden data from the Energy Action Network in Vermont. And finally, for communications, we looked at cell service and cable and fiber connections. These metrics help us identify communities that are unlikely to have backup power during outages, may have medical or other needs that go unmet during outages, and are likely to be unable to get help because of a lack of communication infrastructure. Finally, we also took into account a community's interest in partnering with us and their capacity to participate in a project. For this pilot round, we identified and engaged with 15 different towns as part of our community outreach process. For the first year, we're going to work with four of these towns to develop resiliency zones, Rochester, Stratford, Brattleboro, and Grafton. The town of Rochester was severely impacted by Hurricane Irene, and the entire downtown area was without power for days. Even today, the impacts of Hurricane Irene remain fresh in the minds of town residents. In order to improve the resiliency of Rochester, we will develop a solar and storage microgrid to support downtown residents and businesses. This includes around 75 residential and commercial customers, as well as critical infrastructure like the emergency shelter, which is housed in the local elementary school. The Rochester microgrid will include one megawatt of solar and a two megawatt battery. In Stratford, we also hope to develop a microgrid project based around the existing Elizabeth Mine solar project. The Elizabeth Mine solar project is a seven megawatt project that was developed in 2017. And at the time it was the largest solar PV project in the state of Vermont. It was constructed on a Superfund site that sits on a former copper mine. In partner with Greenwood Energy, the owner operator of Elizabeth Mine, GMP hopes to site battery storage here that can be used to build a microgrid that would support a section of Stratford that includes the emergency shelter, residential homes, and businesses that are proximal to the solar site. In Brattleboro, GMP is partnering with the Tri Park Cooperative Housing Group to develop a resiliency zone. Tri Park is actually the largest privately owned affordable housing provider in Vermont. Almost 10% of Brattleboro residents live in its three parks. The planned resiliency zone will enable over 250 mobile homes to keep power on during larger grid outages. The resiliency zone will consist of a community battery storage system and an intelligent control system. In lieu of a typical parcel rental, Green Mountain Power will create a fund that the park will manage and deploy to residents with the sole purpose of reducing fossil fuel consumption within the homes. The fund can be used for projects such as weatherization, replacing heating systems, and other upgrades that will reduce fossil fuel consumption. Finally, in Grafton, we will pilot a residential battery solution that targets the customers who have experienced a high number of outages in recent years. 
Through an RFP process, we selected Generac as our partner to provide the battery system and accompanying load management device. The goal of this project is to develop a resiliency intervention, which is suited for our remote and rural customers who have significant resiliency challenges, but would not be well served by a microgrid. This also builds on our residential battery storage pilots, which currently deploy around 3,000 batteries in the homes of our customers across our service territory. We hope to continue to work with three new communities each year with the goal of including as many customers as possible in a closer, more connected, and empowered energy system. That's all I have for you today. Thank you again to CISA for the opportunity to present, and I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, thanks very much, Sarah. And thank you to Dr. Zook as well. If everyone could, uh, if you're able to, turn on your webcam. Cam, and we also have Dan Borneo here for questions as well. Uh, we have quite a few, and we have a good amount of time. So hopefully we can get to all of these, or most of them. Uh, one question here had to do with the, the Sterling project that Dr. Jook mentioned in Massachusetts. I'm going to get this out of the way because um, I have the information here. The question is whether the capital costs for that project included the $1.5 million grant from Massachusetts. And so I have the economics right here in front of me. For that project, the total installed costs were $2.5 million. Uh, of that amount, Massachusetts provided a $1.4 million grant. DOE provided $250,000 grant. Um, in the first year, the project saved almost $400,000. The payback period without grants was 6.3 years, so just over six years without the grants. If you include the grants, the payback period was two and a half years. Uh, those paybacks were projected in actual fact, that project did better economically than expected. I believe the payback occurred in just under two years for that project. Okay, that out of the way. Uh, question for Sarah. Uh, for the Rutland project, going back to the original uh, Stanford Hill project, why not cover more of the community load in islanded mode? And um, it's an interesting question because as as we stated earlier, that project is connected to a, a school across the street, which is the designated emergency shelter for the community. I believe uh, the size of that battery project allows it to support critical loads at that school almost indefinitely. Um, so the question is, why not support other, uh, other areas of the community, other loads of the community? Is that something that could be done, at, or is there any thought of doing that, Sarah? Yeah, I mean, what I would add, Todd, is that the the larger you're expanding the radius of an island, the more area that you have for something to go wrong in that island. So, so if you're doing a small microgrid, it's pretty secure and it's pretty easy to be like, okay, we can take care of all of the, um, you know, vegetation management required to make sure that no tree is going to fall within this area. If you're trying to cover a lot of your customers, you just get into the situation where you might have a tree contact, a tree coming down during a severe weather event, which would take out the entire microgrid for everyone. So that is definitely a consideration. Okay. Um, here's another question about making the the project profitable. I think this is again about the Stafford Hill project. Uh, says, please elaborate. It sounds as if a lot of it came from using battery storage to offset the need for more peak facilities. It, um, it's related. Um, the 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 way this works, and feel free to jump in, Emery and, and Sarah and Dan, if you uh, have something to add. That the way this works is that utilities in ISO New England and in other uh, areas around the country are um, paying the ISO for capacity services and for transmission services. And their portion of those payments are calculated based on these monthly and, and yearly peak hours. And so if they can do anything to reduce the load in their service territory during those peak hours, they can then reduce their share of those capacity and transmission payments. And over time, 
that does in fact reduce the need for for peakers because it reduces the size of the capacity peaks on at those peak times. In other words, it levels the, the load across the region a bit. But that that's how that works. Anybody want to jump in on this one or should I go to the next question? Yeah, of course, it's interesting because if a really large number of people does it, uh, you reduce the load, uh, the need for peakers, but at the same time, uh, those who are not doing it will have to pay the entire amount, uh, you know, the, their entire share. And so it becomes somewhat inequitable. So what you would have to do is you would have to take the cost of the peakers that are no longer uh, necessary and somehow use those as credits if you were to design a self-consistent structure. Yeah, that, that's an interesting question. It gets into the, the design of the capacity markets. And uh, I should mention that capacity and transmission are two different things in this regard because the transmission system is a sunk cost that has to be repaid, much like highway costs are repaid by tolls, whereas capacity is based on future needs and if the and if the load is flattened then those future needs are reduced so um, they're slightly different in that way but we can that's probably a topic for another uh, for a different webinar um, okay so here's a question I think this is for Sarah again is the goal to create multiple small microgrid islands to eventually be able to support entire towns, or will it not extend further than emergency centers and some families? So we're definitely starting out with critical facilities and things that are located proximal to them. I definitely think we are interested in expanding these, but again, we're the context is really important. So in some towns, there really is just a little strip of a town, um, especially a lot of these small Vermont towns. In other towns, there is um, sort of a place where it would make sense to expand. So as I mentioned for Panton, right now it's 50. The expansion of that would look more like 900. Um, but for some place like the area that we're considering in Stratford, for example, there's sort of a section of small town and then what's next to that so probably not in that situation okay so it, it's dependent on the layout of of the community is, or what's within is this take this is taking advantage of existing uh distribution lines correct so so it has something to do with where you can reasonably expect to uh, put a switch in to island a portion of that line is that right yeah, that's right. Um, and and for the initial round of these pilot projects, we're trying to make things as easy on ourselves as possible. So that means doing sort of the most pared back, smallest approach in a lot of these cases. Um, and also, you know, it will it will depend on cost curves of technologies such as reclosers, um, which are essential to creating islands. Great. Um, you know, it's uh, fairly in exciting to me that this is being explored because it seems to me that there are existing large scale batteries on utility substations uh, in various parts of the country that could potentially uh, provide community resilience benefits in addition to whatever other benefits they're already providing uh, with the addition of some of these reclosers, which sounds like a, you know a fairly inexpensive way to extend the, the benefits of an existing battery. Is that something that can be done, a sort of retrofitting existing storage to provide community support? Um, I am not an engineer, but I believe so. I mean, so for Panton, definitely, we started out with the solar project and then we added the batteries. And then I think a year or two after we added the batteries was when we started um, exploring the microgrid capabilities. So I definitely think for that project, there was sort of that, that delayed timeline that you just mentioned, yeah. So, so Todd, this is Borneo. Um, were they asking 
to increase the reach a of a one microgrid or to have multiple smaller microgrids? I, okay, I'm not sure I quite understand. I, I think I understand what you're asking. Uh, my understanding, Sarah, correct me if I'm wrong, is that uh, what's happening here is that Green Mountain Power has large battery on a substation in a community providing services to the utility, such as uh, peak shifting and so forth, and that in order to make that battery benefit the community in, in, in resilience as well as cost savings, what they're doing is that they are isolating a part of that existing distribution system with a, uh, essentially turning it into a microgrid with that one single large battery. But in some of the other communities, as I understood it, Sarah, you said that they were, there was also a plan to incorporate distributed batteries. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. In Grafton, we'll be doing a pilot project that looks more like a residential home battery storage pilot. Yeah. Okay, so that would be an aggregated uh, bunch of behind the meter batteries that again would serve a larger community? Is that is that it? No, they're serving just the homes that they're in. Okay. All right. So so does that is that answering your question, Dan? Well, I was thinking I was going I was referring to the question that was asked by the audience of uh increasing the reach of the microgrid. Maybe I mis misheard the question. I think the question had to do with whether it was just going to be a few critical loads that are supported or whether it was going to be entire towns. And I think the answer was it's it's dependent on that specific location and, and what can be done given the way that the distribution system works in that area. Yes, so along those lines, as uh, Sarah mentioned earlier, that if you keep increasing the reach of one individual microgrid, then you basically run into the same problems that you would have with your regular distribution system. You know, the more reclosers, the more equipment, the more land you're covering, then the more possibilities for uh, problems to happen. So when, when you're talking about resiliency, the closer to the load that you put your renewable resources and your energy storage, the better off you're going to be because it's less likely to have a problem. So at your home, it's less likely to have a problem than down a block or a half a mile away or a mile away. Resiliency begins at home. Okay. Uh, Sarah, any comment on, on any of this? No, I mean, Dan hit it, yep. Okay. Uh, we have some questions on um, non-wires alternatives. And one of them is simply, what is a non-wires alternative? And basically, it's a way to uh, achieve what, what traditionally would be achieved by expanding uh, poles and wires and, and other aspects of, of distribution equipment in an area, but, but to do it with uh, an alternate solution such as energy storage. Um, and so before I go on to other questions about this, um, can one of our speakers maybe give sort of more, more a better definition than that than I just did? Uh, or maybe an example of non-wires alternatives so that, so that people understand what we're talking about here. So I, I have uh, what I would consider non-wires is demand reduction. Okay, can you explain a little bit more about how that works? <laughs> well, you know, not to be flippant, but turn it off. You know, reduce reduce your use, uh, reduce your load, reduce your need for the load. I mean, these these are all kind of 
you know, really basic things, but um, if you don't want to increase the wires and you don't want to increase all your, your service, then you need to decrease your load. Okay. So, so in other words, rather than um, putting in larger capacity distribution lines in order to provide more power to a community, if you, in the context of energy storage, you could add some batteries to enable uh, power to be stored and used closer to load so that you don't have to tra uh, put more power through those those lines. So that, that's basically what we're saying. So so that is the, the yeah, you can say it that way. Okay, so uh, here's the question. So uh, for Green Mountain Power, location of community solar projects in acceptable locations is a must. Some of these preferred locations are near transmission lines. It would help to set up uh, 150 kilowatt arrays if GMP could match them up with a transmission line. So I don't, I'm not sure what the specific aspects here of the arrays are, but it sounds to me like what they're saying is, um, can can something be done to to put solar and or storage uh, near transmission lines in order to, I don't know, provide services to the transmission system and also make it easier to interconnect the projects. Is that something that's being looked at? Um, that's definitely not something that's been really considered in terms of my resiliency zone work. I know that we have um, a solar map that helps guide people who are considering solar um, to help decide whether or not you know it's a, a good location. Um, but yeah, in terms of siting solar specifically close to transmission, um, that's not really something that we've looked into too much, to my knowledge. It is, however, okay. a trendy field of interest. Uh, So-called gets are getting quite popular, at least to write about. Now, it, isn't that um, uh, sort of what, what's happening right now with the Shi'i project? Yeah, it is. Okay. Well, um, in regard to that, somebody wanted to know where that's where in North Troy that's being installed. Um, it might be a good opportunity to say a little bit more about that project. I don't know, Sarah, if you can speak to it, or maybe somebody else can speak to it. I, I don't recall exactly where in North where it, it is being installed. Um, but I do know that we're, we're uh, working with both GMP and VEC, which is another utility, um, and that it's supposed to be reducing wind curtailment and uh, congestion of the transmission system in the area. And, and if anybody wants to jump in with more information, feel free. So I don't have the map in front of me, Todd, but if that um, whoever asked that question wants to reach out, I can provide them that, that information. It's like right in this, the middle of the state, as, as I recall, but I don't remember the name of the, the town that it's near. It's Troy. Okay. Yeah, I think that the person wanted to know more specifically where it's going to be, but I, I and I don't have that information in front of me. Uh, feel free to, to contact us afterwards if you if you want to, and I'll look it up. Um, okay, can GMP provide a technical reports for their distributed energy programs? I guess that that would be the uh, the customer battery programs. Sarah, do you have any? Does GMP have any technical reports on that? Um, I don't know that we have any prepared, but if people have specific data questions, um, they can definitely contact us. Okay. Um, here's somebody wants to know if there's an opportunity for private entities to partner with GMP to create another uh, of these microgrid projects. This person says they know of a of a privately owned solar and storage project planned in Gilman, Vermont. 
um, and an innovative wood to energy project for the same location. There's also hydro on site. They want to know how to, I guess, get in touch with with Green Mountain Power to see if there's an opportunity for a for a storage project there. What what um, is there some way for communities or groups or individuals to to propose projects? And how are you planning the the ongoing? You said three communities each year, I think. So. Is somebody is there something somebody can do to sort of get into the queue for one of these projects if you have a community where you think it would be appropriate? Um, yeah, so the best thing to do is just to email me. Um, so we're subscribed for this first round of pilot projects, but we will be looking at um, considering additional projects in future years. Um, so my email is sarah.puri at greenmountainpower.com. Okay, thank you. And, and you can see Sarah's email on the screen now, so uh, opportunity to jot that down. Uh, somebody is asking about flow batteries. I guess this is a question for you, Henry. It says, do we have a good list of emerging or current flow battery companies? Can you say more about why flow batteries will be emergent next? And do you know about any notable flow battery installations? Dan, you might want to jump in on this as well. Yeah, flow batteries can handle longer durations fairly easily. Uh, essentially, a flow battery has two containers, and it has one, one type of electrolyte in one container, another type of electrolyte in the other container, and then they go into a power module, uh, they flow into a power module, and that's where the electricity is uh, produced. Uh, alternatively, you can uh, provide electrons in that uh, power module and charge up uh, the liquids. And because you ma can make your tanks easily as large as you as you wish, the power and the energy are decoupled. So in this way, you can uh, go into four to 12 hour storage with flow batteries. Now we have all kinds, we have vanadium flow batteries, we have iron-based flow batteries, we have iron chromium, uh, you know, all kinds of metals are candidates. And it depends to a large degree how efficient they are and how inexpensive the metals are. Uh, vanadium, Flow batteries are probably the most advanced at the moment. Uh, however, vanadium is certainly more expensive than iron. So there's also a number of uh, successful iron, comp uh, iron flow battery companies. Uh, all of these companies are relatively spe speaking much smaller than lithium ion providers. And uh, they are in the beginning stages. Uh, however, the uh, capitalization uh, is beginning to be fairly good, and we can look forward to seeing more of those. And one of the advantages is that if you do things right, uh, your electrolyte after 15 or 20 years uh, can easily be recycled. But of course, you have to make sure that your system works to begin with and there are no flow batteries around uh, of a particular company uh, that have, let's say, 10, 15 years of experience. And Todd, to add to that, so uh, Emery and I have personally had some bad experience with vanadium flow batteries. However, there's, there's a big push now for the long duration energy storage and the flow batteries on paper may seem to be seem to maybe fit fit the bill for a long duration energy storage battery so uh sandia is working closely with california energy commission and they are um they have uh, uh 350 million dollars i i think they're going to be putting most of it towards long duration energy storage technology so we're going to be helping them 
vet these technologies and do some research on them. Also, um, you know, we continue to root around with uh, the flow battery manufacturers. I was just uh, texting a fellow today, uh, John Davis, who I've been with for 15 years through the industry, who's now um, the CEO of a a vanadium flow battery uh, uh, company. And we're looking to maybe get a small flow battery, have him send us one for some testing on our site. But, um, you know, there, there's a lot of literature out there that says this flow batteries are in operation and they're doing well. Though I have not personally seen any of them. So if you're a flow battery manufacturer out there and you want to uh, get your wares out and uh, I'm open to come kick the tires of your system. Okay. All you flow battery vendors out there, Dan Borneo is ready and uh, willing to come check out your product. A uh, couple more, uh, we have just a couple minutes left. So just quickly, a uh, question for Sarah. Can you share more about the community engagement you did when identifying these projects? Yeah, um, so our community engagement is really just about um, reaching out first usually to town officials um, and then having a, a series of community conversations um, to discuss the data that we found, you know, why, so why we're reaching out to them in the first place, tell them a little about the options that um, might be available to them, and then look with them specifically at the outage data to try to identify, you know, what are the real challenges of reliability and resiliency that are making your community stand out to us, and what might be the best fit in terms of how to proceed. Okay, great. And last question. Um, Sarah, again, can you speak briefly on the financing of these projects? Are they self-financing? Are they profitable? Is there a charge to customers? Do they impact ratepayers? Um, can you can you speak to that? Yeah, so all of these um, projects are still in the relatively early stages of development, so the financing definitely hasn't been worked out entirely. Um, all of our projects include a battery storage component, so there are um, revenue streams associated with that, um, both peak shaving and frequency regulation. Um, and then there, are, um, for several of these projects, we're also considering pursuing some federal funding um, that's being becoming available from the Biden administration um, as a way to supplement that. Okay. Well, um, thanks very much. I want to thank all of our presenters, uh, Dr. Jook from DOE, Sarah Lipman Perry from Green Mountain Power, um, Dan Borneo from Sandia, and everyone who joined us for the webinar. It's been recorded and you can view it or send somebody a link if you know somebody else who might want to view it. It should be up on our website very soon as are all of our archived webinars over the past decade or so. Um, I will pass this over to Samantha now for a few last words, and um, she, she's going to tell you about some upcoming webinars you might be interested in as well. Thank you. Thanks, Todd. So we do have some upcoming webinars, which you can read about on your screen. We have one tomorrow, which should be interesting, um, on the topic of quantifying the health benefits of clean energy policies with the EPA's AVERT and COBRA tools. So we'll be having a demo on those two very interesting tools tomorrow. And then the next webinar we have is late in June on Clean Energy Group's new Peaker Power Plant mapping tool. And we've got some interesting guest speakers lined up for that webinar, and we'll be doing a demo of the tool. Um, and we have some more things in the works, so stay tuned. You can register for these webinars um, at cisa.org slash webinars. And as Todd said, we'll be getting out a recording of the webinar today and a copy of the slides, so stay tuned for those. And thank you all again. We'll see you at the next one.